little intro and then cool. pass it on to you. You can see my screen, okay? Or my yeah, good. All right, hi everyone. Good morning. Oh, sorry, not even good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening for those who are joining us from around the globe. Uh, we're sorry about that 15 minute uh, little delay. However, uh, my name is Nadia. I work for the Reactor here in Sydney. So we'll be bringing you a session today called Building a Power App in an Hour with Bruce Sithol, who is one of our Microsoft MVPs. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you, Nadia, and uh, welcome online, everybody. Um, so quick introduction, and before I go blow on with the intro, is I've got my QR code on there. If anyone wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, you should be able to point your phone camera at that QR code and take it to the right um, profile on me on LinkedIn. But um, as Nadia said, so I'm a Microsoft Business Applications MVP, and I've been working with the I guess Microsoft Business Applications for over 10 years now. Um, but specifically Power Apps in the last, I think, four years or so. And um, I really got into it because I was at, um, I guess, a wit's end with a previous um, customer I was working with where the CRM, their sales team wasn't really adopting CRM, just they found it clunky and all the typical challenges of getting salespeople to capture all their activities into your CRM systems. And I remember Power Apps came out and I mocked up a quick power app for them. So I kind of jumped on board on it straight away and got a really got a lot of good feedback and traction from the um, sales teams. And that for me was kind of the light bulb moment when I was like, this stuff has a lot of kind of um, potential legs. I've been uh, looking into them extensively since then. And um, I think they're awesome and provide kind of great value. And uh, hopefully today is I'll kind of show you how you can build some of these simpler power apps and it should kind of enable you to at least get that curiosity or get some ideas in your head of how you, you may use them within your own particular context or within your companies or within for your other customers. So I'll start off with a little bit of um, not too heavy in the PowerPoint slides, but just kind of set in the context or explaining the different um, terminologies because um, out there in the World Wide Web, there are different kind of nuances you need to be aware of. And then I'll go through and um, show how we can kind of build a, a relatively straightforward map within the allocated time. Um, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. You can either type them in the chat or come off Oh, just doing the Q&A. I think Nadia will then respond or kind of shout out to me. I'm not sure if you can actually um, come off mute and uh, ask questions, but I'm, I'm all for questions throughout. I don't need, um, I should be okay with the, the interruptions. So currently there's, I guess, uh, multiple ways you can create apps. Uh, there's Microsoft Excel, which is, seems to be a go-to for most organizations. Um, I saw an interesting stat a couple of weeks ago on Twitter that most startup companies, you know, the newer, trendier companies are actually competing against companies who are running their business off an Excel spreadsheet. And I know I've lost count of the number of times, even just here in Australia, where I've seen um, AS, ASX listed companies who have a significant part of their business running in Excel. Um, we also have, I guess, Microsoft Access, and then there's actual your obviously your full kind of development capabilities. So that's opening up in things like you know Visual Studio or whatever your code editors are. So each have their own kind of I guess strengths and weaknesses. So Excel is kind of easy, and the barrier to entry is you know is there is no barrier to entry really. Whilst development you can kind of get more refined, but you know a lot more different kind of skill sets are, are needed. So I guess this is where um, and why we kind of tr try and create apps or the challenges of where, why things like spreadsheets pop up or um, other kind of components is that um, these are kind of the key areas where um, businesses have challenges even when we're, they're trying to do, uh, I guess, digital transformation. So um, there's always time and resource constraints, there's budget constraints, you know, everything typically might need to be approved as a project or you need to get sponsorship sign off. Um, there's a lot of paper based processes and, you know, always hear feedback, oh, it just works, you know, so let's not, if it's not broken, let's not try and fix it. Um, and also, tied into those time and resource constraints, right? This is when you start getting shadow IT. So there's some great software out there where it makes it really simple for someone just to whack their credit card 
on um, their sign up page and then next thing you're subscribed to this new cloud service but that also has its own challenges too because now that data is now siloed it's external sharing is a bit of a, a challenge and then trying to consolidate that in um, and so you kind of start turning on all these other different lights and then that total cost of ownership kind of increases so you may need someone who specializes in uh, let's just say Marketo and someone who specializes in Salesforce and someone who specializes in whatever product someone may have signed up for as well as your internal products. Um, and then I guess that total cost of ownership and the lack of silo data will just actually make it more costly for your business um, or your, your customers. So this is where the Microsoft Power platform looks to um, Kind of come to to the rescue or be uh should be considered as a strong option and it's that's the one low code platform that spans across both office 365 dynamics 365 and it's all underpinned you know with um the power of azure so knowing that you know and and this power platform keeps kind of ex expanding so what we're going to touch on today is just a sub fraction of under power apps so one of the types of power apps um, but there's other things in there you know be the virtual agents the ai builder power automate there's lots of investments microsoft is continuing adding in this areas here everyone knows typically about um power bi and flow or what is called um what's called power automate now but just know that this low code platform is um it's really kind of to appeal to all types of developers, be it citizen developers, the pro devs, because as far as you can take these low code platforms, you can still extend them and jump into code. But the idea is that you don't need to jump into code straight away. So as I mentioned, what sits on top of or you know what's underpinning this is your Dynamics 365, your Office 365, Azure and your existing business apps and data. What I think is also really great about, I guess, the Power Platform in general is the number of um, connectors available. So there's over 300 connectors and they continue adding to these. Uh, Microsoft continue adds to these number of connectors. And it, it's it, it's encouraging that it's the kind of the new Microsoft, right? So you will see there's connectors to things like Salesforce or Google Sheets or things like Gmail, which you typically, or are Microsoft competitive products, but they Microsoft's kind of taking the approach that they know not everyone's will be using everything Microsoft, so it doesn't really matter where your data resides. They kind of want you to kind of say, hey, look, let's leverage the Power Platform and start you interfacing or kind of leveraging your existing um, uh, investments. And so all these connectors, there's multiple. There's kind of point-to-point -point ones. So there's a connector for, let's say, Instagram or for DocuSign, but then there's also your connectors that connect to, for example, your different database type so it's kind of you know it's not a point-to-point -point solution and there's also the ability to use what's called like an on-premise data gateway to bring in your in-house information up to the cloud and after all that if there's still no connector you can kind of use the or leverage they allow you to build your own custom connectors which you can then deploy into the into your environment so really there is where there's a will where your data resides somewhere there is a way to get it in you know, I haven't yet come across a scenario where we couldn't get access to the data with one of the connections or connector methods available. So why should you be getting involved? So hopefully because of these three points here, so it is easy and uh, hopefully today you'll see a little bit, a little glimpse into how relatively straightforward it is and it is powerful, right? So uh, the impact of, of some of these apps you can create is kind of is transformational and you'll get that quick ROI too or return on investment from businesses and then it sets you up for success so this is where Microsoft is investing heavily this is the future of um, Microsoft and there's a continual skills shortage and demand for people with these types of skill sets um, be it to kind of develop these these business applications um, so certainly it's it's, it's relatively easy to get started too. There's a lot of great resources on blogs out online, videos, um, you know, articles, and a, a really good and engaging community, um, be it locally in Australia or globally too. So there's a whole bunch of different um, uh, music groups and communities and forums where people are very generous and kind of look to help anyone coming 
on board. It's, it's a very welcoming community. I find the Power Platform community, so it doesn't matter if you just started today or you've been at this for a while. Um, everyone's kind of on the same on the same path. So the focus for today is on Power Apps, and just very high level, there are multiple types of Power Apps. So there's what are called Canvas Apps, which is what we'll be I'll be showcasing today, and these are very task specific type of experiences you can create within within um, a power app. Um, there's also what's called model driven apps. This is traditionally you can almost kind of think of it what used to be your CRM um, types of scenarios. So it's for back office uh, environments where you can customize your own business process flows and it's very structured. And there's also what's called power apps portals, which is for public facing. Um, well, if you want to expose any of your information out to the public, you use Power Apps portals. And just on that note, so the Canvas apps we'll be creating today are not for you. Don't you wouldn't use Power Apps to be creating your next Instagram or TikTok application. This is more for your business applications, so it's more B two B, and it's not something you'd kind of develop once and then look to expose it to all your customers to download from the Android or or Apple Store. So you need a login to access Power Apps through a mobile device. Okay, so just to reiterate, we're starting with Canvas Apps and it's for task specific um, experiences. So Canvas Apps, they are, it is for the more tailored to it's for all developers across but it just allows or enables those who are um, maybe even more in the kind of on the business end um, be it business analysts or technical BAs to create and use the canvas apps to kind of build apps for business users and quickly evaluate if something is going to work or not right and what's really great is uh, Microsoft reiterate that you can use your existing Excel and PowerPoint skills and at first, I didn't quite understand what they kind of meant by that, but I'll um, hopefully that will come up, become a bit clearer today. So you can connect to any of your data that you already have, and then you can kind of move things and tailor the experience and kind of use your own intuition on what may be a good user experience and and simplify that process of um, either task creation or completing a certain um, job. We have also seen Canvas apps used quite effectively is um, when you need to merge data from multiple systems into one um, clean interface. So um, some organizations may have a, a legacy supplier platform where you need to set up suppliers. Then there's another system where they raise purchase orders from. There's another system for invoicing. So people would hop and jump around between different systems and copying numbers across. But I've seen we can kind of create a canvas app that simplifies that so it looks like it's one or it is just one app but one interface but it's connecting to multiple data sources and it simplifies that process of you know going through um the multiple systems so as these apps are task specific um we need a kind of a scenario or context we need to work with so um today's scenario which i'll be walking through is um I'm calling it breaking breaking the ice and you know context is sometimes it's hard you know to strike up a conversation a room full of strangers there could be people from diverse backgrounds and so what we'll do is we'll build an app where you can just type in something um i guess in english and then call a translation service to translate that text into um, your specified language and then use even like an audio control to play that back so the person who you may be trying to um have a conversation with can you can use that as a little bit of a, a as an icebreaker but again it's, this is kind of you know a little bit of um a little bit of a uh, just more for awareness a little bit of fun but you can also then start seeing the key concepts or components which you can use or apply in your specific um scenario so the objective now is that we're going to create a power app we're going to connect it to a data source in this case the microsoft translation service and then we're going to call a translation service to get to translate our English text into the desired language. Does that all make sense? OK, so now we will go through the build and demo. Before I start with that, I'll just check in. Are there any questions so far? I 
something called good. So what I'll do first of all is I'll, I'll jump into Excel. And those of you who are comfortable with Excel, you know that you could do things like, um, let me just type in this column here. I can just go A, B, C. That's a static text. So this is just um, showing, uh, what I'm trying to do is show what you can do in Excel and show how it applies within your Power Apps potentially. So you can go in Excel, something you can do things like this. So you're calling a function called length and everything is um, referential. So, you know, in Excel, you can say give me equals length and then I say this is in column B4. So it'll get the length of B4. And then that obviously there's three items in there and then this is all dynamic, right? So if I change that, it becomes 12. If I just do that, it says one, delete that, it says zero. Um, likewise, you can then reference that other column too. So I could say something like equals if C4 is greater than zero or greater than two, you can say something like yay, otherwise it's nay, right? So everything, it's kind of multiple chains. So if I go, uh, if I just yeah, do one, that's one nay, I change that to go yay and so forth, right? So um, it is just kind of your, your basic kind of Excel capabilities. Then coming back into uh, my PowerPoint, um, I'm pretty sure you've all seen this ability here. So I'm, I'm on this, let's say I'm on my slide here. If I want to insert, um, oh, what do I want to insert a text box, right? I can select that. I can just drag that in there. I can say this is app in an hour. You can kind of expand that, obviously. You can move it around. You can change using your standard Windows um, ribbon, the font color. Um, you can change the font type, obviously. You can make this bold or italic and so forth. Um, you can change the shape fill and move this around. So this is kind of your typical um, PowerPoint and um, Excel like capabilities. And now I'll show how we can use this to um, build a Power App. Hi, Bruce, just quickly. Um, are we able to increase the size of the font on the Excel? Some people are having troubles being able to read the font. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Let me see if I do that. I'll make that a little bit bigger. Um, it was more for, I guess, the formulas here. I don't know if I can just zoom in on the formulas. Uh, this, what this said here is just uh, equals. I can zoom in on. Oh, I should have used that to zoom it tool. But basically, um, let me see if I can paste that in here. Will that make a difference? Nope. Let me do that. That is what my formula was in there. That's given this um, value in here. So I'm saying give me the length of what's in B4. So when this changes, that number automatically changes. So if I typed A, B, C in here, that becomes three. And similarly here, if I just copy that bit of it. Uh, oops. My formula was saying that if C4, so if this column is greater than two, then display yay, otherwise display nay. So some basic if else kind of logic within um, uh, Excel, so that's standard functionality. And then I'll show you how you can use these within um, Power Apps. Coming to Power Apps now, we, what you need to go to is into your environment, so which may be something like make, or well, how you get there is make.powerapps.com, and you would need a, your Office 365 login, so you can set up a trial or you can use your existing account if you have any. And so you can then, in the left-hand side here, go on, click on create. And as I mentioned, there's three types of um, Power Apps. 
Canvas app, a model driven app, and a portal. So, what we're interested in today is the Canvas app. And we just need to select the kind of the form factor and we'll give it a name. So, I'll call this app in an hour. And I'll click on create. So, what this is doing now is kind of setting up your Canvas or your area you'll be working with and um, sh showing you kind of. Just basically setting you up so you can start building out your, your app, obviously. So what we have here is um, on the left hand side is your tree view. So it shows everything that's currently available to work on. And this here is in the middle of the screen is like your designer essentially. So you can put components and different items on this um, canvas. And then to the right hand side is typically the properties of anything you've selected within your um, area here. So I mentioned um, how we can kind of use Excel, like uh, not Excel, I guess there's more PowerPoint now, so we can insert different um, controls. So we've got a label, which is something that'll be read only. So we can just go click on insert and label, and then it adds that onto our screen here. So we can set or change the text in that label. So this could be app in an hour, or we could call this um, ice. Breaker. Oops. All right, so there's my label there. I could give my label, I could rename this if I wanted to, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. Um, coming back to the home tab. So this is kind of your common, you know, your typical uh, Microsoft or Windows um, ribbon. So you can see here now I can change the font of this. And if I was to select something, hideous like that font there. I could then um, increase its size again too. So I'll make this a bit bigger so most people can see. Um, I can make it bold and what I can do too is I can change its background colors um, as you would basically in um, in um, PowerPoint. So I'll change that background color to blue, but I'll change its primary font color to to white for example. And I'll just change that font back. It looks a bit hideous. And your typical text alignments, so I can make this um, center aligned. So it just looks a little bit nicer and cleaner. You can drag that to the top. And starting out already, this is me building my app. All right. So what I mentioned too was that there's a different type of control. So this is now your input. So this here, this. When we when come to the, the language translation, we want somewhere to type in what we want translated. So this will be your text input here. And likewise here, this can have what's called a default value and also hint text. So we can have a default of nothing and then type in the hint text saying, please type in the text you want translated. And Again, so some of this stuff you'll get familiar with it as you start using um, Power Apps more frequently. So I know, for example, I may want this as a multi line type of um, text control. So I can just drag that over there. I can resize that. I can change all the borders and, and so forth. And if I was to kind of put in a label again, so this is now I'm going to show a little bit of Excel like um, formulas. So the text here, this is what's called static. So it's kind of like hard coded, but I can make it dynamic. I can make it be in reference to another control. So my control here is called text input one. So I can grab the name of that control and say for this particular label, I want the text to be whatever's in this particular control here. And how you do that is in the text property of this label, I would I could either type this in or so I could start typing text input and then IntelliSense picks up all the different control names. And so I want to select this control and then now I need to tell it what properties from this particular control I want um, in that in that label. So in my case here, I want um, I want the text, right? So you can then combine these two, right? It doesn't have to be only dynamic or static. So I could say something 
I could add this to say you typed. And then concatenate it and just go add. And that kind of previews what you're, you know, with the, the specific text and also anything you've typed. So right now I haven't typed anything in there, so it's obviously showing blank. But what you can do is, and this is how you start testing your app. There's the preview mode within um, the editor. So you, you do all your editing within the browser, right? So as long as you have a modern browser, you can um, use, um, you can create your Power Apps. So if I was to go preview and start typing something in here, um, is this working? You can see now that's kind of just updating that label of that field without, you know, just because it's got the reference to that text control. Um, and then you can imagine that you can do similar things as I mentioned in Excel. So I could say if the length of that, or actually I could I can show you that actually. So if I type in, um, I think that the parity is about ninety, uh, about ninety percent um, of the formulas you can use in Excel. You can use within um, Power Apps. So if I was to type in length. This will now return the number of characters that are in my text box here. So that length is exactly the same as that length there. So now you, I hope you can kind of start to see how it makes sense that it, you know Microsoft says that if you can use Excel and you can use PowerPoint, you can basically create um, Power Apps. So that is obviously also dynamic too. So as I change this, those numbers decreases. So you can add in your own rules saying if the length is less than three, then you know you don't want certain things to happen. But um, so that's just some high level kind of concepts of the capabilities of within um, Power Apps. So now I'm actually going to go out and build um, the the crux of the solution is um, that the language translation capabilities. So what we want, so we've got our area here where we're going to type um, the text we want translated. So then we also need to then select what language you want to translate it to. So what I'll add in here is um, a drop down control. Just drag that over here. And right now it's just got sample data that Microsoft provides. And so this now what I'm going to do is show you how you connect your app to external data. So you, on the left hand side here, there's another little icon for your data sources and it shows you all the connectors available. So remember that that um, slide deck I showed you with the so over 300 um, kind of connectors. So this is where you kind of can select them. So um, you can see this is a long, long list of them. And the ones I want to use, for example, I know is called the uh, Microsoft Translator connector. And so when you select that particular connection, it kind of just does the quick kind of plumbing so that it's associated within your app. And knowing this, so everything in Power Apps is by reference. So right now, coming back to my drop down, it's pointing to a sample set of data, but I want to point it to this Microsoft Translator um, data sources. And I know that if you just, if I just start typing, I start typing Microsoft Translator. The IntelliSense picks it up to say, look, it knows that it can find this. Um, and then what I want to bind it to is what's called um, speech languages. So this, these are the languages available that can be converted not only from your text, but also from um, text to audio, which I'll hopefully um, um, show you too. So you can see that if anything shows up as red, it means it's a little bit of an error or there's an issue. So you always have to kind of close your brackets, right? And it's as simple as that so far. So what, what this is showing now is um, if I go preview, it's now got a drop down list of all the different languages and their language, I guess the language codes. So it's a good start, but exact, I wouldn't know exactly 100% what language KO maybe. So we can change that in the properties of this drop down control. So each drop down control, as I mentioned, the right hand side here has the um, properties component. And instead of showing the language code, I want to show the language name. And then now you can see it's got the list of the language names, right? So um, I can then select these now.
And I'm going to add another button that says, um, and what we want to do, so I'll drag this button here. I'll change this and add the text and say, call it translate, for example. So um, this is as, as kind of as this is where it gets a little bit um, not more complex, but um, this is as a little bit of the low code starts to come into play here. So what I want to do is when this button is clicked, so this button has properties and one of the properties on select. So when it's selected or tapped, um, when this is selected or tapped, I want to call this Microsoft Translator connector and pass it the text that's in here to then translate it to the language that I've chosen here. Okay, so I'll just go through this now. So what we do again, we do we call the translator or reference the translator connector. And then oops, in there, it'll have an action called translate. And it gives you that IntelliSense up the top here. So it says, you know, what it wants the text to translate. And if you recall, we've got that. We know that it's this text input control here. So I can type in its text input one. So I could rename that if I wanted to. And it's the text from there, right? So then I add a comma and now it's saying, so what's the language you want to translate it to? You know, e.g. fr. So we know that's the code based on this drop down in here. And this drop down control is called drop down one. So I can just say drop down one. And then the item I actually want to do or choose is the, I want to get the currently selected, um, selected item within that list. And again, this, once you do one or two drop downs, this will become very kind of normal, comfortable to know that a drop down has a property called selected. So it will have a long list of all the languages, but you only want the one that is currently selected. And from that selected one, I want you to give me back the code. All right, and then we close this off. So just to reiterate that, we're calling this method from this Microsoft Translator um, connector and that translated takes input of text. And then it says, well, what's the target or what's what language you want me to translate it to? All right. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to store this in a, what's called a variable. So a variable is just a temporary placeholder for memory or location. And again, using a variable, you can reference it at multiple places. Um, so if I call this and how you create a variable is just type in set. And you give your variable a name, so I'll be like variable um, translated. So you can see that the intelligence says, what's the variable name? And then you add a comment, says, well, what's the value? And the value I want to put is this returns the translated text. Um, so I want the translated text stored in a variable called variable translated. Right, I hope that kind of makes sense here. I'm just looking at the questions here. I hope we can't create. Um, yes, so just looking at a question from Andrea here on the chat. You do need to log in with, um, you, you can set up with like a work email address and you can do even what's called like a community trial or community plan, which is absolutely free. But um, you can also spin up a, a trial and use your, your personal email addresses too, I believe. But there is a way to um, get started without having to um, use your company address. Um, so coming back here, just to, so I've created a variable again, just to hold the translated text. And what I'll do is I'll insert another label called label three here. And again, instead of having the text, um, the static text in there, I can reference that variable that I created. So if I start typing there, translated, that's what's now referenced in this label here. Okay. So with a bit of luck, I can do a little preview now, a little test. And what I can do 
is type in something in English and say hello. How are you doing? Um, the language I want to translate it to, I can start with, uh, yeah, Arabic for now, and I'll click on translate. So, um, and you can see that actually happened pretty <laughs> quickly. So that's the translation that's come back. Um, if I was to choose another language, something like uh, is there French in here, and click on translate again too, you can see that that's coming back now, pretty kind of quick and, and, and snappy, right? So, and just kind of stepping back for a moment, this app here right now, if I was to go hit save um, and then publish, and publish is the click of a button, is compatible on both um, iOS, Android, and on the web. So imagine if you were trying to roll this out to 500 people within an organization, like this is as far, this is kind of as hard as it needs to be. Right, you're not going through the whole Apple certification process or the Google certification process that could take days or weeks or or even months. Um, it's basically um, drag and drop. You know, hit save, publish, test it, and then you're sharing your app. You kind of you can fail fast too. You can have a quick proof of concept. Say, is this going to work? Will this likely you know um, bring value or not? Um, and how we can even extend this is a little bit of here as we have a bit of time is I can actually get the as part of this Microsoft translator service um, it actually has audio capabilities so I could add in another button and I'll give this text to say get audio and what I want to do on select here is again um call the microsoft so i'll call it i'll, I'll go for the the nor, not normal way but i guess the logical kind of way so i'm going to create a variable and i'll call it audio and what's going to be in this um variable is again the microsoft translator and in there you can see the methods that are available so it kind of gives you um options in there and i want to say text to speech so then it asks you so it says which text do you want um, to translate and if I'm correct it'll be this label here so if I just rename this label to um, translated label just for example come back here so if I change that name, it updates all the references across your app, so you only have to change it once in one area. So I can start typing translated label, for example, and I want the text from there. And if I just hit comma again, it'll say, look, what's the language code to generate the speech for? And again, I'll select the drop down from here. So if I go drop down one, and it's the selected item within that drop down, and it's the code we need to provide. Right. And I think that should be it. So now we've set a variable for the audio. So that's pretty relatively straightforward. Um, if you think about that, you know, if you take a step back, if you want to call something, do some voice translation or for some text recognition. We kind of built this up relatively um, well. I've built this up relatively straight um, forwardly, um, if that's even a word. And what you can do now, because I've got this audio set in a variable, there's another control in here that's called where is it? Oh, it's under media, and there's an audio control, All right? And I can bind this again instead of to a sample audio. I can bind it to this variable. So I can say variable audio. This is what I want in the media to play, right? Um, and I don't think I shared my audio in here, but let me just, um, again, you can do lots of little previews and tests. So if I just click on get audio, so you can see the button's grayed out. Um, and if I click on play, all right, so I'm assuming nobody heard any of that. Let me um, 
let me sh can I share my audio? Hold on a second. Hang on. Jake. Hi, you might need to reshare share your again. deck and then include um, system audio. audio. Yep. Yes, so I'll just go share. I'll go include system audio. Yep. Always missed that step. Um, All right, there we go. Let's give that one a go. Coming up. Um, so what I'll do, I'll just press play again and let me know if you can hear that. Bonjour, comment vas-tu? Yep, I could hear that. And again, this will work with a whole multitude of kind of languages. So if I wanted to put this into Korean, click on translate. Um, I could simplify this app to say, you know, one button does both the translation and the audio. Um, and I'll click on get audio. So this is hello, how are you doing in Korean? 안녕하세요. 어떻게 지내세요? Um, that's just kind of a little, I guess, bit of um, an, an example of of how you can use that translation service in there. Does there anyone who'd want me to, does anyone want to validate or test any of these languages? Is there a particular language someone wants to, um, wants, wants me to test out or try? Um, you can ask this in the Q&A on the question of how, or to Nadia directly. I think I saw that. Yeah, that that's what that's the button I was looking for. Thanks, John. I was looking for that icon in there to share the audio. So question, any Indian languages? Uh, Hindi. There's Hindi in here. Um there's Hindi Indian and Hindi just standard Hindi. Um and is anything who is that? Um, quite a few that come through. We've got Hindi, Japanese, and Spanish. Okay, so I'll translate. I'll just keep the text as it is. Um, translate. So that's in Hindi. Um, is that pretty accurate or, or not? I shall I do get audio too and let play that back. Hello, Tumhara, kya chal raha hai? So it's a little bit kind of computerized or kind of digital, but um, I think the pronunciation and accents aren't too bad. I will go and select Spanish. Where is Spanish? Oh, this is not sorted. Let's translate that. Oh, hold on. Let's, let's get the audio. Hola, ¿qué tal? Something a bit quick. I'll just play that again. Hola, ¿qué tal? <laughs> and um, the final one I may do is I think I saw someone asked for. Oh, I think we got a, a, actually a really good one that's come through. Someone wants uh, Russian so they can validate it. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure the difference between Russian and Russian <laughs> Russia, but um, let me translate that. And let's do get audio of that. What's the volume like? The loudest. Привет, как дела? How is that Russian? Привет, как дела? So I guess under the hood here too, I mean, Microsoft keep adding to these, um, the number of languages they support. So they support more languages from, I guess, text to text rather than text to voice or to audio, but they keep adding to this. So um, 
you know, they, they, you always kind of need to come in here and make sure it's all kind of up to date. Um, so we've got validation here that the Spanish worked and the Russian, I guess, was <laughs> close enough. Um, so I hope that kind of made a little bit of sense um, in terms of uh, the, the Power Apps. Um, so again, you know, kind of employ you to, you know, go and have a trial of this and have a play and you can add, keep adding more components. You can make it as busy or as messy as you want to. You can hook in navigation. So what I guess that didn't show is you can have multiple screens too. So you can um, navigate between screens. So if I had a success, success screen, I could go from this screen to that other screen and kind of keep building this out as, as much as you want to or as very little as you need to. Um, I'm happy to take any more questions now. Um, We've got quite a few questions under the published section published. in the Q&A. Okay. Well, maybe I'll go from the top. Well, no. Anything you haven't marked or the like? I assume you haven't. Uh, let's try Russian, Spanish. Word. So yeah, so the first question would be, is the Translate service using Azure Cognitive Services? Under the hood, yes, it is it's using Azure Cognitive Services. Could you please increase the size of the font? Yep, font size. Does the Power Platform fall under the Dynamics 365 branch? Um, Dynamics 365 runs on the Power Platform. So it's the kind of the other way around, if that kind of makes sense. So underpinning the Power Platform is what's called the Common Data Service, and Dynamics 365, be it for sales or for customer service, runs on um, the Common Data Service, which is a part of the Power Platform. Um, looks like some people's Alex was trying to create the app. Sign in. Okay, I'm having some browser issues. Uh, yeah, that's good advice. Personal work emails. Another question here. Are you able to detect language that is typed in the text box or does it only support English? Um, that's a good question. And there is um, the ability to, to detect the language. So if you had a look in, um, you could type in anything in there. And if I add another button, um, and I try to call the Microsoft. I can spell this later. There's a detect function, and it says it detects the language for the source um, for the text you provided. So I can say detect, and I can say tell me what's in text input one dot text. So then you can then type that in. So it doesn't matter what you actually type in. You can then detect it and then translate it if you wanted to. Okay. The Indian languages, Spanish. Let's try Russian. Spanish worked close enough. Can we add some data visualizations onto this canvas? E.g., some bar charts, pie charts, ECC. Yes, you can. So there is some, um, there is some, uh, just a little bit of limited charting capabilities within here. So you can add these simple charts, but you can also embed Power BI um, tiles and visualizations in here, and also. There are um, what they call custom components you can add in in into your um, Canvas apps. Be it um, um, it's got support for PCF controls or what are called Power Apps component framework controls, as well as what are the ones? Um, what are these ones called? The ones within um, Power Apps uh, components. Yeah, you can add a new uh, component, so you can design something and create a visual and then reference it and share it across multiple apps if you wanted to. It's a really good question. I think another one that was coming up that was quite popular was about the community plan and being able to sign up without having a work or school account. Because I know we had one attendee uh, trying to sign in but didn't have a work or school account and wanted to do it individually. How, how would someone go about doing that? Um, I uh, guess community plan without a work email. I think the only way I could probably um, think to do that is if you had a, an alternative email, even an alias that wasn't, you know, at gmail.com or at outlook or at hotmail.com. Um, 
even if it's like a little redirect email or something, but I think they do look at the most common um, free email or personal kind of email providers and try to um, restrain or block, not block, but yeah, just make it a little bit more difficult to sign up on using your personal email address. So it's a shortcut because um, a lot of people do uh, typically can't sign up with their work email because maybe their their internal IT systems or IT uh, processes have blocked access to trials or to community plans. Um, so yeah, you may need to kind of create just an email alias for those um, for that purpose. Cool. I hope that answers your question, Andrea. Uh, it looks like we've had one more question just come in. It says, so to clarify, the CDS is what is connecting Microsoft 365, Dynamics 365, Azure and the Power Platform? No, it's not what's connecting all of them, but it can connect them. So underpinning them. So if you wanted to put something in to, if you wanted to share things very easily and seamlessly across um, Dynamics, across Azure, across Power BI, ac across your Canvas apps, you you, you put that in um, CDS. Basically, what this is is it's it's within your actual environment, right? So if you whatever Office 365 account or um, subscription you have, that's what connects them all. So you could um, you know you can have a Power App that connects just to SharePoint only. You can have a Power App that connects to Active Directory or to Azure or to CDS or to Dynamics 365. It's um, it's all just underpinned under, I guess, your actual, um, uh, your account or what you log in with. So in my case here, I've got my work email, bruce at 365mechanics.com. So that's what kind of gives me access to it. But yeah, you can connect them using things like common data service, you know, and it doesn't have to be always in your own environment. You can do cross environment connections I will just put this up here. If there's any kind of questions or anyone wants to connect or email, you can, there's my email address there or not. You can share to in the, um, to the attendees after if that's um, needed. So it's just Bruce at 365mechanics.com, but I'm still obviously happy to kind of take any questions um, on this call. Uh, we've got another one that's come through as well in the publish section, Bruce. Sorry, that's two that's come through. Yeah. Okay. Is there a way to connect to a backend DBMS data managers from this interface, such as a to do or look up? So the question, I guess, is um, using is there a way to connect to either like REST based web services or to DBMS, which I assume is database management systems. Um, so yes, there is uh, ways to do that. So you could, under the connectors here, connect to, for example, um, I type in database, um, or if I go SQL. So you can do like if whatever your databases may be, but also if there's nothing here that's specific to your use case, you can add in um, custom connectors and then reference those in here. So you can create a, your very own bespoke REST API and um, reference it within your Canvas app to either push data using that API or even display or read data from that API and display it within your app. That's a good question. So the next question was, could we also use this tool to create a login screen to have a user enter user ID, password, and have a user authenticated? Um, technically, yes, you could do that, um, but that kind of dives into the complexities of of what's um, the licensing for that, and um, probably heading into uh, a tricky area within the Microsoft licensing called multiplexing. So you couldn't use this to create, you know, one app that all 500 employees use to. Um, just uh, you know to kind of circumvent licensing. So anyone who's interacting with the app typically needs to have a license, either their own 
i.e. they bring their own license to your environment or provision through your existing environment? Alex says, I just found the answer to all my problems. I have no email started for work and I can't use my personal. Oh, well. Um, yeah, Alex, you can probably just reach out to me after this and um, I'm sure I've, I'll, I'll double check, but I think there's, there is a way around getting the, um, getting you at least a trial without having to have a work email. But um, yeah, you can reach out to me after this, Alex, if you want, and we can um, just troubleshoot that. Awesome. So I will um, I will pop Bruce's email address in the chat for everyone who wants to reach out. I know there's been a couple of questions about having um, no work or school accounts, so Bruce might have a solution for you after this. Um, yep. But I think there's one more question. They've asked, can you talk a little bit more on portals? OK. So Power Apps portals is how you can um, expose data within your CDS environment externally. So you think about uh, if you got a, an account with, um, I don't know, Telstra or Optus and you can log in there, you can see all your billing or you can raise support tickets. That is where you, uh, like a, a typical good use case for Power Apps portals. So um, you, 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 again, it's kind of this, um, you build them from the interface here, you drag and drop the components, you configure what are called like the entities and the fields you want displayed, and then you'd um, hit publish on that. And so uh, I think, do I have an example? Of, um, so here's a Power Apps portal, which we've just been mocking up internally just as a little um, awareness for the team. So what this is showing is you could have um, I guess the concept we're showing was you can create a, a, a power app that is for coffee ordering, a Canvas power app, and then likewise, actually, let me just switch to that app. Where is it? 365, I think it's in POC. And then likewise, you could have an external facing portal that you allow people to kind of um, come to and then they could sign in and make orders. So these portals are responsive by design, um, so they should. Um, yeah, you know, they look good on mobile and so forth. So that's how you, this is good for your B2C kind of scenarios to kind of create an app that anyone can use without, um, it allows for both anonymous access. So if anyone wants to go to this URL, they can, but also for certain actions or tasks, you can make it that people need to be logged in or need to sign in. Hope that answers that question. Cool, and we'll let this one be the last question. Um, once this Canvas app is created, what can be done with it? How can it be published or used going forward? So the first time you um, save it, it'll automatically publish it. So what you then need to do from here is you there's this concept of sharing the app. Um, so you can share an app with individuals within your organization or with specific um, groups too within your organizations. And depending, this will then give um, that particular um, people or group access to this app. So if I was to come back in here and I go to the apps and if I was to go to details, what this does is basically provide the, the front facing um, like app URL. And then as an end user, if I wanted to use this app on my mobile, I'll download the Power Apps app from either the Apple um, Store or Google Store. I'll then log in again with the same account that I have here. And then in the list of Power Apps there, this ICE or App in an Hour app will be available. And then when I click on that, this will load up. And one thing I didn't mention too is um, what's really good too about Canvas apps when you're building them or designing them is they can leverage your device capabilities. So there's controls in there to say, you know, show me your current location and that can use your, your device's GPS. Um, click to dial will launch your device's, um, you know, phone dialer. Um, and so you can kind of leverage, you know, you could use your, your device's camera to take photos and upload um, pictures or videos 
all within this Canvas app. So um, again, that's uh, another um, capability that you show how you can quickly use these apps to develop and build out um, apps for critical kind of use cases. So a common scenario which we've worked on a couple of times is um, for site inspections. So people go out on just various sites. Oh, and one more thing too, these apps on a mobile, they support offline capabilities. So you could have an app that someone's using to take um, inspections. They can go to an inspection site. They can capture photos. They can make comments. They could draw on or make comments on certain pictures. They could save that all offline on their Power App. And then they come back home or to the head office, sync it up. They can use like the Wi-Fi to then like sync it all up. So, um, and again, that's just reusing your existing because a lot of people, you've got Office 365 subscriptions or Office 365 account. You can build these power apps, you know, and then depending on what level of license you have, you get certain access to different connectors or premium versus non-premium connectors. But again, this is leveraging your existing subscriptions that you have. And so that's just the concept of, of publishing. So you can keep publishing apps and then you can then see the version. So you can then roll back to. So you could have an initial V1 that goes out and then you can work on your V2. And then people who have the app in their on their phone would only get V2 once you've done a publish again. Great, thanks for that, Bruce. I think that's going to wrap up our Q&A section. Um, and I'm quickly just going to jump in and share my screen just to take everyone through some upcoming events that we are having at the Reactor. Um, and also where you can find the recording for this session as well. Let's pop that up. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at reactorsid at microsoft.com. Uh, as mentioned, this session has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel within the next day or so, so you'll be able to find that. I'll also post it up in our meetup page, so you'll be able to access it as well. Um, we do have quite a few events coming up that I like to just get everyone across. Um, tomorrow night, we're running a session on the story behind Microsoft 365 May. So we had a group of MVPs do a month long virtual event series for Microsoft 365. Um, and we're gonna be met with the organizers behind the scenes of all of this. So if you're interested in wanting to run a virtual event or how to get your meetup off the ground or how to, you know, have a virtual presence, feel free to join this session tomorrow night. And I just want to note that these times are in uh, Australian Eastern Standard Times. We also have another session on Thursday called Elevate Your Documentation with PowerShell Jupyter Notebooks. So this is going to be a very beginner session where they're going to introduce you to Jupyter Notebooks and PowerShell, um, take you through some advanced scenarios and how to navigate through. And another fun session we have, and we have run this one before, and it's backed by popular demand on build your own virtual assistant in Teams using Azure AI. So this will be run by one of our community influencers, so feel free to check that out. If you do have any feedback for today's session, um, you can access our survey link. I'll also pop that in the chat, um, aka.ms slash reactor slash survey um, with the event code 7970, just so we know which session you are talking about. Um, other than that, I want to thank you all for joining us today from wherever you are. You will have recording to this session. Um, I've also popped Bruce's email in there for you for those who've asked questions about um, having an account uh, with a personal email. But other than that, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and your evening and your morning. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, Nadia. Thanks, everyone.